Ladies and gentlemen, the following is the speech of world's youngest professor, Saborno Isaac Bari, at Harvard University, hosted by the Harvard College Project for Asian and International Relations, HPAIR. Hello, Saborno. Uh, it's nice to hear so much from you. And I'm from Bangladesh. I had a question. Wormholes from you. Wormhole is a shortcut boost to a space in time that's faster than light. Stop that's a theory. And if it was correct, then it would disprove Einstein's theory that nothing can move faster than light. You are just like the young Sheldon. Um, if nothing can escape from black hole, then won't the whole universe eventually be swallowed up? The universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. Black holes will only barely have an escape velocity uh, uh, that's faster than light. And so, since the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate, eventually there will be more universe to suck up than black holes that can be sucked. So there will always be new universe to be there, uh, uh, even if black holes suck up the rest. So, no, the entire universe won't be sucked up by black holes. But there is a huge possibility that we will. And eventually, in about uh, the 10 or 20 billion years. Yo, oh, pretty good. <laughs> Very interesting. Your, your session is the second most people attend. I'm extremely excited to start the uh, HPIRE conference. How about you? Yeah, uh, me, uh, too. me too. Me too. Welcome to the executive seminar at HPIRE Asia Conference 2021. Today is day three, and we are really honored to have uh, Mr. Saborno Isaac here with us. Let me briefly introduce him. Um, Saberno Isaac is an Asian America prodigy, author, and world's youngest professor. I'm honored to be at Harvard University, to be hosted by the Harvard College Project for Asian and International Relations. For nearly 400 years, Harvard has stood as the most prestigious university in the world, and has created many great minds, including 161 Nobel laureates, eight American presidents and 131 Pulitzer Prize winners and has become a source of global advancement by achieving medical feats ranging from spreading the smallpox vaccine into the new world in 1799 to cracking the code of HIV in 2019 and also has made some great scientific feats including black holes which will be the topic of my talk today. Harvard has created many great thinkers including Amartya Sen who came from Asia just like my parents. Asia rock. This is why I was overjoyed when I received recognition from one of the most famous Harvard alumni, President Barack Obama. This recognition created a ripple effect. And soon, that ripple reached the Harvard president herself, Drew Frost, in 2018, who recognized me on my sixth birthday. I am giving this speech at a time where there is a large tension between Muslims and Americans. This tension has recently been fueled by the rise of the Taliban and their takeover of Afghanistan. I, in this speech, aim to not only inspire the audience, but every single child, especially Muslim children, not to dream of becoming the next Osama, but to fall in love with math and science. We were becoming the next Sir Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein. This is why I am giving the speech. In fact, I will be achieving that goal in this speech by telling the story of how I myself fell in love with the math and science. It all started on the eve of my second birthday. It was April 8, 2014, actually the night of that day. And right before I went to bed, I asked my father, Dad, can I please have a gift for tomorrow? But I wasn't asking for a toy or a game or anything like that. I was asking for a puzzle, a challenge, something that would change my life. And my father satisfied the request. Next thing I knew, I was woken up by my father screaming, Go to room zero now! And so, I went to room zero. And room zero was really just a makeover of my garage. He just removed everything, to say the least, and then put up some blackboards. And then for whatever reason, he called it room zero. I don't know why he called it room zero. Stop asking me that. But anyway, I walked into our garage, hoping for the best. 
I saw something on the floor, but I ignored that, probably for later. I looked at the blackboard. Hmm, it seemed there were instructions. They said, find the name of the book and the author of the book. You have one hour. I thought, <laughs> and then I laughed. I realized how easy this challenge would be. Did it not say the name and the author on the spine and the cover? What, did my father think I was illiterate? Was my father crazy? There were so many possibilities I was failing to consider. But then I looked back at the book. But there was no cover and there was no spine. Just a ragtag bundle of pages sewn together by a skinny white string. I, that was jaw dropping. How could I do this? Flip through the pages, desperately looking for a name. But every single instance of Newton's name and the book's name, they were all black that. So, what could I do? I flipped through the pages in desperation, looking for a name, when suddenly I saw a schematic of the earth fly by. Flip back to that page, and I saw not only the earth, but there was a cannon there. This would be pivotal. Eureka, Eureka, Eureka. I thought like Plato in the old days, and I wasn't in Plato's cave. Rather, I was being enlightened. <gasps> I've got it. I saw ball after ball was being shot from the cannon, that they all fell, made a touchdown with the ground, and failed to get into orbit. But one ball was shot with sufficient velocity, so much, that it went all the way into orbit and never made a touch. How could this happen? Well, gravity is strong, strong enough to keep it in orbit, but velocity is fast enough to keep it from falling back into the earth. It's like spinning a water bucket on a rope. The rope is like gravity, uh, the water is like the moon, and my fist that I'm using to spin around it is the earth. Ha, huh. what an analogy. This is the basic concept of gravity. And I realized Newton was the first one to realize this. And I also realized this was a 1700s looking book. It has to be Newton. Nobody else discovered it in that time, except hint, hint. No, it wasn't Linus. I'm sorry, Linus fans. So it must have been Newton. The author must have been Newton. I wrote it down on the blackboard, but I realized, what was the name, man? What could be the name? I was going crazy. What could it be? But then I realized with only 60 seconds left, there was a cannonball on that pixel, correct? And there was also the author being named Sir Isaac Newton. <gasps> I've got it, Eureka, Eureka, Eureka times two. It must have been Newton's cannonball. <laughs> Clap for two year old Shabir, won't you now? I was extremely confident. This must have been right. However, I later found out that I was dumb. This was wrong. How? Where did I mess up? What? But two-year-old me found out it's not named Newton's Cannonball. It isn't even named in the English language. It's named in Latin. Principia Mathematica, or whatever my little two-year-old mouth spat out after seeing that on Google. But, regardless of that mistake, I just pushed it away, we forget about the mistake, and move on, and I fell in love with the math and science on that day. That's how we want to make sure every single child falls in love with math and science. Now, when they fall in love with math and science, they won't dream of committing the next 9-11. They'll dream of committing the next scientific revolution. And to talk about Newton or Einstein, which is what these kids will dream to be when they grow up, what were Newton and Einstein's most famous and most groundbreaking discoveries? What did these two lads discover? Tell me. That would be the theory of gravity. The theory of gravity, at least the Newtonian one, was discovered by, guess who, Newton in 1665. And while well, Newton's gravity law worked perfectly, he even wrote an equation for it. 
which uh, had an inverse square nature, so we call it Newton's inverse square law. And he used this inverse square law to predict the exact motions of any heavenly body. The moons, the stars, the planets, you name it. He could do them all with one single equation, f d equals dmm over r squared. Inverse square law, hint, hint. <laughs> but the thing was, Newton was hiding one big, bad, embarrassing secret. I don't know why uh, this painter didn't paint his uh, cheeks rose red. Because he didn't know how gravity works. And he was like, what the hell is the gravity thing? I mean, I know the equation, but what uh, the hell is it? He knew the why, but he never knew the how. Which is the problem with our teachers nowadays as well. But anyway, he needed another brilliant mind. Specifically, this man, the mustache man. Not the other person, not the H man, but Albert Einstein, another great mind, who would change the world for better, not worse, like the H man, and he was the one who would bring the next scientific revolution. And he was the one who not only measured that Newton's calculations were point zero 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 one percent wrong, he's ridiculous. But he also explained the true meaning of gravity to the public. How did he do it? Special relativity. Now, the reactions to special relativity at the time were mixed, to say the least. Special relativity, people before 1911 were saying, hey, what the is this? What the herb is this crap? This shouldn't be allowed. This is a debauchery. But uh, only a, few, a small percentage of scientists in the scientific field actually accepted it. But over time, as the experiments to disprove Einstein's great theory failed, the acceptance of uh, Einstein's theory grew. And by 1911, basically everybody except the conspiracy theorists thought, hey, this guy's right, let him be. So, that was uh, Einstein's acceptance. But the thing was, special relativity and general relativity pointed out something that was really skeptic. Many people were skeptical about this, but the answer was, it was black holes, the topic of my talk. What were black holes? We will actually talk about that at the end of the speech, but to talk about how Einstein revolutionized the world of science, turned it upside down, we must first discuss how Newton who was the person who made me fall in love with math and science, paved the way. So Isaac Newton was born to a single mother, Hannah Isco Jr., who would have been his father, a rich man named Isaac Newton Sr., and that's it about him. At least that's all he know about him. And he died three months prior to the birth of, uh, birth of baby Newton. Now a strange fact is that uh, his mother actually said that she, baby Newton was so small he could fit in a mug. I don't want to drink that. But anyway, Sir Isaac Newton was a distinguished child, to say the least. He was very smart, a bright young man. He uh, built sundials and model windmills to distinguish himself from his classmates. And his uh, mother, uh, who got a new stepfather, was, uh, had passed him on to his grandparents. Now, Sir Isaac Newton hated, H-A-T-E-D, his stepfather. And, well, he made a list of threats, to say the least. He made a list of sins he had committed against his stepfamily until he was 19. Um, and nobody tell us. And one of them did include threatening to burn down his stepfather's house. But that's for another time. That's a story for another time. Ever wondered where the second half of Newton's life went? Well, now you know. But, anyway... Sir Isaac Newton was a very bright young man, and his mother asked Newton to become a farmer, something he hated even more than his stepfather. Oh my god, he hated being a farmer. Man, uh, farmers are not Newtons, to say the least. He instead went on to become one of the greatest scientists in the world. And then, oh, big, bad, scary, black plague. He was studying at Cambridge University when suddenly a bout of black plague happened in London and he had to run for cover. 
and if so, that was the worst bout of Black Plague ever since the Black Death in 1348. Oh my bubonic plague, that's big. But the thing was, Newton could quarantine. He didn't quarantine in Wolfdorf, of course not. He quarantined under an apple tree. <laughs> and that's Newton style, okay? So while he was quarantining under an apple tree, he was sitting under it, and then suddenly, bonk, an apple fell right next to him. <gasps> Of course, we're not exactly sure if it fell on his head. The only thing he aptly said is that he was inspired by the fall of an apple from an apple tree. But, anyway, Newton now looked up and <gasps> there was the moon. He had to retreat to Woolstorm. The big, bad, black plague zombies were going to catch him. But, to that, he realized, what about the moon? The moon isn't a special object, it's just a big kind of an apple. But it, it, the only difference between it and an apple was it's sufficiently bigger, it's sufficiently more heavy, and you can't eat it. So, Newton realized this moon is not special at all. No matter if the best poet wrote the best music on this uh, moon, it was crap to him. It was just the same as an apple. And I'm sorry to all the poets that will be bankrupted. The moon is not sp special, weird kind of thing. Sorry to all the astrologists and all the poets that have basically just died by it because of my speech. <laughs> but uh, Newton realized that this moon was basically just a gigantic apple made of rock. So he realized, what if he threw the apple with enough velocity that it would actually go into orbit? And it also probably blow his arm off, but whatever. At least the apple went into orbit. We like that the moon is also falling, not just the apple, because the moon has lots of gravity. The moon had some gravity uh, pulling on it, but if the gravity was the only thing, then Newton realized the moon would just come crashing down into the earth. Newton realized that the moon was just a giant apple, just it had a lots of velocity so it wouldn't fall into the earth. <gasps> ah, now Newton knew it. But the thing was, how could he find the exact equation for the attraction of gravity? His, uh, the math of his time wasn't advanced enough. Newton realized that he had to give up? No, because, well, uh, there were his math of his time was not advanced enough. So did he give up? Of course not. He's Newton, not the random normie. He didn't give up. He invented an entirely new branch of math to compensate. <laughs> Newton, you truly are a tryhard. But Newton realized that calculus was the only way to solve this problem. And by using that, he got the inverse square law. Newton realized that this was what he needed to formulate fg equals gmm over r squared. And that was the end of Newton's story because the, the thing was Newton's stuff worked uh, super well but at the same time there was also a clan of scientists investigating something investigating something called electricity and around the 1750s uh, which is around the time uh, that Newton's theories were fully confirmed investigators realized that current it's a thing but uh, they also realized the inverse square nature. What they commented was uh, particularly similar to Newton's law, but they didn't actually get any inspiration from it, despite what you may think of Coulomb's law. But Coulomb got the full equation. Probably the top half was inspired by Newton. But he wrote that the electric force is equal to a constant, just like Newton's uh, equation, times charge 1, just like Newton's equation, times charge 2, just like Newton's equation, divided by r squared, just like Newton's equation. So Coulomb might have been inspired, to say the least, by Newton. But this started the electric revolution. But the thing was, just like in all the war, ancient wars, the English outsmarted the French. This time not on the battlefield, but on the electric field. And the winner, the victor, was Fahrenheit. 
But before we talk about Faraday, let's talk about a Danish scientist who paved the way. Han Orsted was a scientist who was so excited with all the new discoveries that he changed his entire class schedule to current, 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 current. This copious amount of current didn't only electrocute him, but it also captivated him, made him dance in the office, totally not from electrocution. But one day, while he was setting up a wire to demonstrate to his class, he left his compass near a wire. Oh no! But then, when he flicked the wire on in front of his class, he noticed the compass was deflecting. He immediately dismissed class and went to get more compasses. He placed a few around the axis of the wire. They all pointed in a circular direction. He drew out the electric field or the magnetic field that this could create in Eureka, 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 Eureka. He had found it out. That must have meant that an electric current, flowing electric current, can generate a magnetic field. Wow, now we are thinking. But the thing was, electricity and magnetism were yet to be intertwined. That was another person's job, Faraday's job. Because there was no connection, almost at least, between electricity and magnetism. But one young, aspiring, yet poor student was about to change all that. Sir Michael Faraday. Uh, he didn't have the title, sir, but I liked to call him that. But Faraday was born, uh, well, yes. He was born in 1796, and he didn't quite get what an education was. In fact, he remained completely illiterate until he, in 1810, when he was 14, he received the knowledge of reading and writing from a Sunday church school. Not the best education, to say the least. Uh, well, still, he, he was dirt poor and his education was essentially non-existent. What could he do? Well, as crazy as he was, he applied to Sir Humpty Dumpty. Uh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. That's what happened when you read cartoons instead of science. <laughs> he decided to try and work under the mentorship of uh, Sir Humpty Dumpty. And he was <laughs> accepted once again! Wow! Let's give a big clap for Faraday. But anyway, Faraday has finally made a step toward his new dream. Now, he had extensive knowledge of chemistry, one that extended more than even the most not knowledgeable chemist in the world. And he left and Sir Davies' class with chemistry and curiosity. Now, one day in 1831, Faraday had been doing something he had uh, been, you know, working on. What he had been doing was he took a magnet and a copper coil and he realized, hmm, according to Sir Humpty, that must mean that it must generate current. He had learned a bit of physics from Sir Humpty. So he realized that when he moved this magnet through the coil, it must generate electricity. But why? How? He realized there was this something called oh, the electromotive force, at least he called it that that, well, was a type of voltage, an induced voltage for ma a magnetism. This voltage then created current, which created electricity. He had done it. Others had already connected um, electricity to magnetism. They said, uh, Hans Orsted said, hmm, electricity generates magnetism. But now, Faraday says, screw you, magnetism generates electricity. Volta woke up from the grave. <laughs> and then he said, Mamma Mia, what are you doing? And then Faraday said, screw you, I already got the equation, the idea. 
the power of magnetism. I don't need freaking batteries to power everything. Who's going to power an entire city with, with batteries? We just need a giant magnet and a giant coil. Pfft, loser. But, anyway, that was Faraday's great discovery. But, Sir Humpty didn't teach him math at all. So, <laughs> what could he do? So Humpty Dumpty wasn't very viable anymore. He had fell off the wall and cracked himself. So, so yes, his health situation was actually deteriorated. Maybe it was a big crack. The egg yolk was spilling. But now, what could Faraday do? Nothing, actually. The job to translate Faraday's findings into math would be done by Maxwell. Yes, the man with the big, big beard who looked like Osama's twin. Oh, so who's the big, big beard man named Maxwell? Let me mention that Cavendish actually wrote Coulomb's Law. It should be called Cavendish's Law. And in fact, uh, fun fact, Maxwell was the one who published Cavendish's findings. And then, uh, fun fact, 10 years later, after Cavendish did his work, you know who? Coulomb plagiarized it. So Coulomb really is a plagiarist. Now, Maxwell was the one to disconnect electricity and magnetism. Two pieces of the same uh, puzzle. Two sides of the same coin that hadn't been discovered for so long. But finally, the pieces had flipped, the tables had turned, and Maxwell, the big, big beard man, was writing down his equation. Let me give you a summary in layman's terms, to say the least. All right. In layman's terms, Maxwell equation number uno states that the electric flux must always be proportional to the enclosed charge by a surface area. That must mean that if you have a Gaussian surface S and you have a bunch of charges trapped inside this, if you have a bunch of charges trapped inside and you take a little space, you can measure all the electric charge going out that space using a Maxwell's equation. Ah, all right. Number two. Number two, or Maxwell equation number dos in Spanish terms, says that, okay, it just says the magnetic flux is zero. There are all by stating that, I mean magnetic, uh, what do you say again? It says that the sum of the magnetic field over a certain surface area of a Gaussian surface S must always be equal to zero or zero. Because, well, magnetic field lines are unlike electric field lines, and there were no monopoles. So, yeah. Finally, you have the third equation. There's also a fourth equation, but we don't talk about that one. We trapped it in the basement. I'm just kidding. We brought it out. We brought it out just for today. Maxwell equation 3 is a bit tricky, but it's basically the mathematical form of Faraday's law. Something that Faraday wasn't exactly able to translate himself. You know, Sir Humpty Dumpty fell off a wall, Sir Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, he couldn't teach math anymore to Faraday, and yeah, that. And that must have meant Maxwell had to translate that into math. And so Maxwell took Faraday's findings, copied them down, then realized, this must mean magnetism field can generate electricity field. Now Big Beard Man is thinking, now he's thinking. And then finally, you have the fourth equation, which is basically just copied from Ampere with a bit of rewriting. Basically state that the sum of the magnetic field over a closed two-dimensional loop, or that's what we call a line integral, the sum of the magnetic field over the length of a closed loop is equal to the, the enclosed charge going through that loop plus the displacement current, which basically uh, says, you know, magnetic field generates electric field, so yeah. Well, electric field can also generate magnetic field, thus if you have electricity, like with two parallel capacitors, then that also can be used in the displacement current, which basically states, hmm, electric field equal magnetic field, so yes. So that's the Ampere-Maxwell law, and that was Maxwell's great discovery. And Maxwell indeed paved the way for Einstein. Einstein even said he was inspired by Maxwell. But before we talk about Einstein's theory of relativity, let us talk about the basic reference rate. It's perfectly smooth, empty road. 
and you're biking on that road, at least at 15 MP8, when suddenly, homeless man! <laughs> and the homeless man, I, well, he has disagreements, to say the least, just like in real life. You know, how you intend, uh, you give him money and you intend for him to buy food, but he buys other things than intended. You have disagreement just like that, but in reference frames. Because, from your frame of reference, you're at 0 MP8. The homeless man's running away at 50 MP8. Mm, makes sense, considering he doesn't want you to run and move. And you're treading dangerously close to the street. But then, the homeless man sees you as uh, traveling at 15 MP8, while he's at 0 MP8. What could this mean? How? Well, the thing is, he doesn't move from, neither of you move from 0, 0, 0 in your reference frame. So you think you're at rest, and he thinks he's at rest, and both of you think the idol's moving. Very weird, right? But there was a third thing both of us ignored in that scenario. Car. Now again, we have disagreements between us and the homeless man. And so, we see that the homeless man thinks this car's traveling at 30 mph, but we think this car's only traveling at 15 mph. How? Why? The car man sees that, that the homeless man's moving backwards in his reference frame because he's moving forwards while the homeless man's at rest. And he sees you as moving backwards at a slower rate. Because the homeless man thinks you're at 15 mph, but the car man thinks you're at minus 15 mph. How? Well, you can subtract 30 from 50, uh, what the homeless man sees because the car is moving forward at 30 while the homeless man's at rest. That means that the car man sees everything is going backwards. So you can offset it from the homeless man's perspective by minus 30 MP8, giving you 15 from the homeless man's perspective. Minus 30 is minus 15 MP8. At least that's what the car man sees. All right. But the thing is, the tricky thing is the speed of light actually is something different to say the least. So how is it different in even the slightest? Well, the thing is, no, from no matter what reference frame you or the homeless man is in, well, whether he's walking and migrating to another spot on the street or you're just moving away from him, anyway, that you you and the homeless man for once agree that light is actually traveling at the same speed from no matter what reference frame you are in. So that means if uh, instead of n plus n equals 2 and I said during my birth, but I rather said c plus e equals 2c, I would have been wrong. But mom would still think that I was right anyway. But anyway, the thing is, what happens when you travel at an extremely fast speed? Well, there's some fancy kind of little thing called time dilation. Say that you're on Earth having a peaceful time and suddenly big bad rocket spaceship traveling at the speed of light in the sky. What? Now this may seem confusing, but you see it and there was a laser and the mirror in it. Now, you saw that uh, somebody turned the laser on and it uh, went to the mirror and back. So, you realize that th this motion must have taken a time, t equals to 2 times the length of the spaceship divided by the speed of light. But then you realize there's also, not only that, but also the horizontal movement of the spaceship meaning that it must travel diagonally. So, you use the Pythagorean theorem to formulate the real length, and that turns out to give a longer time. But for the spaceship guy, it only seems to be 2L over C, or where, whereas for you, you have a longer length, that's a longer time, because the speed of light cannot change in any reference frame. Thus, we come to time dilation. People who move faster seem to have time flow differently for them. Interesting, correct? But you also have to have length contraction because since time's been fricked up with, then you also have to frick up length to keep the velocity of light the same. That's the concept of special relativity. But then we get into the tricky part. Gravity, the core, the heart of this theory of relativity. What 
on Newton was failing to explain this is how Einstein called it. Uh, all took all his theories, combined them together in one little mass of ideas. And that was the Einsteinian theory of gravity. There is this four dimensional thing called space time, where space and time are intertwined. And it's really actually a 3D space, at least that, that's how we can observe it. And when you have a body, then it curves the space towards it. It's kind of like well, when you put um, surround a ball with no, that's not exactly a good analogy. But it's like when you have a cube and then you stick a ball of a metal inside it. And a uh, Play-Doh cube and then you stick a ball of metal inside it. It pulls on the space time surrounding it. And then you have the monster, the topic of the talk, or at least the subtopic, black holes. These black holes are mysterious. They're the things with the most gravitational pull in the universe. They pull so hard, it literally spaghettifies objects. And uh, yeah, the thing is, that also confirms the conspiracy theory that not only are black holes Italian, but they were also created by Voltaire's against, uh, revenge against Faraday, who are uh, misusing batteries. But, anyway, why else would they spaghettify people? They must have been Italian. Uh, uh, see, that's what I'm telling you. He's taking revenge. We must hide. We must run. Volta has not come back from the grave yet, so hopefully we're safe. Anyways, black holes infinitely redshift anything that comes into the event horizon. And for an Earth observer, time just freezes at the black hole for anything that's passing the event horizon. That's how much black holes break space-time altogether. It literally freezes time. Interesting, correct? But if you are in the event horizon, prepare to face a sad, eventful, and painful death. It's not really eventful. All you see is just a color of black as you get stretched into nothing. It's your bones, your cells, everything. Your feet feel like they're being pulled off. Then your head, your legs, uh, your body, they all get sucked into the black hole. No trace of you returning. Past the event horizon, there is nothing that can return. But what about the zone near the event horizon, but not exactly around it? That's called the ergosphere. And it's extremely strange. Time is half broken, half dilated. And space is also half broken and half dilated. At this point, it's extremely hard to escape, but it's plausible. Now, at the edge of the ergosphere, I assume that it's plausible for even our modern day technology to escape, but hey, we haven't tested that out. No black holes have come extremely near us, because, well, the nearest black hole's 3,000 light years away. The concept of black holes are extremely scary, and we found out that they are real. They are gaining more energy per second, but there is something that can kill them, but it takes a very long process. The final thing we will talk about is Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation is when a black hole usually sucks in things. But sometimes when it sucks in things, and you know, those particles and stuff become imaginary. You know, those particles uh, are never ever exist because they're snapped into oblivion by the black hole singularity. But sometimes these imaginary particles never turn imaginary. They become real and they flee away from the black hole's gravity. I know it's not the best way of explaining it, but it's the way I can explain right now without turning this into a lecture of a speech. And this is how black holes slowly die. Now, this is not exactly death for the black hole because it takes not just millions, but trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions of years to vanquish a black hole. It would take approximately a Google ears, that is 10 to the 100th power, 
to completely evaporate a black hole. This is why black holes are so scary. They are essentially immortal. They can kill anything with one single touch. Black holes, no information can escape. Black holes are one of the scariest things in the universe. But teaches us a lesson. Even they have an end. Everything has an end. Even the universe will have an end someday. Uh, after the trillions of quadrillions of years pass by, heat death due to all the black holes turning into white dwarfs and that turn into black dwarfs. What makes the universe infinitely cold is that the black space of nothingness. But of course, that will happen nowhere near our lifetime. It will take billions of trillions of generations to get there. Now we can enjoy life. And we'll probably even be colonizing space in the next few years. And I hope I personally get to see that. But. Black holes are an extremely interesting topic, and they teach us many lessons about the universe. Perhaps they will give insight not only into where it began, but where it will end. Thank you, everybody. Now I'll take questions. How, Thank you. How Newton's discovery affected black holes, right? Yeah. Well, Newton's discovery affected black holes in a rather big way. First of all, Einstein was inspired by Newton, and uh, so Einstein was also the one who discovered black holes. So, uh, that was one relation that Newton had to black holes. Another relation Newton had is that black holes actually uh, disproved what Newton thought. Newton thought, hmm, everything must be absolute, like time and stuff. But black holes can uh, make your uh, can break space time. It can uh, you know, distort time. Can distort space. And uh, so time and distance. All his ideas were disproved by uh, this black hole looking thing. And uh, the, the, these are the two connections that I think he had. And he well, first of all had a connection with Einstein, who uh, once again had uh, was the one who predicted black holes. And the second of all, he also was disproved by black hole's idea. And plus, the field equation which predicts black holes actually uh, is, uh, was used just to uh, clog up all the holes and uh, the fg equals g m1 m2 over r squared. Which is actually sound like the inverse square law, probably because of the inverse square of r. But, anyway, this... Uh, there are three releases. First of all, he had a connection with Einstein, who had connection with black holes. That, uh, second of all, he also was disproved by black holes. Third of all, black holes were only uh, created as a byproduct of the field equation, which was a byproduct of the holes and the wrong things in this equation. Fg equals gm1 m2 over r squared. That was great. Thank you. Black hole. Okay, I think it will make a day.